Hello and welcome to the HSJ Health Check podcast, where each week we discuss the most important news issues right now in NHS policy and leadership, which at the moment is still very much focused on coronavirus and its impact on the NHS. I'm Annabelle Collins and this week I'm joined by Bureau Chiefs Ben Clover and Lawrence Dunhill and Senior Correspondent Sharon Brennan. So this week we will again be focusing on three main themes. Um, to start with, we're going to be looking at capacity um, and then we'll be um, discussing some of the controversy over the um, recent COVID death figures and then actually turning our attention to the future and how um, con concern is shifting um, in terms of how we deal with um, coronavirus, um, the crisis in the present to how we will be dealing with it as business as usual as the um, weeks and months go on. Um, so to start with, um, I think the best place to start is a story published this week, um, which um, was potentially some rare good news um, as um, Nightingale has been confirmed as being largely empty over the um, Easter bank holiday weekend. Um, and I am hoping that Lawrence, um, you'd be able to give us a little bit more detail on um, some of those some of those figures in that story and kind of what it tells us about um, the overall capacity, um, particularly in London at the moment and how well it's coping. Yeah, sure. Uh, I suppose n normally when a giant new hospital is built and and uh, ends up being largely empty, you'd it'd be called a white elephant and there'd be some sort of public inquiry into it. Um, but in this case, it, it I suppose it, it to some extent it, it represents a success in that um, that spare capacity hasn't yet been needed because L London's hospitals have managed to surge their own um, ICU capacity on their own estates um, and so far have, have it seems they've managed to cope with with the increase in demand um, so well, we we heard that there were just 19 patients in the Nightingale over the weekend um, whereas uh, and in parts of London in the southwest uh, particularly Croydon and St George's the the um, the level of occupancy was 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 much lower than, than we might have expected a few weeks ago, uh, down at sort of 50, 60 percent. Um, I suppose it's Im important to say that that's not that's not uh, the occupancy level on their normal ICU capacity. That's on their surged ca capacity with, with these extra beds that they've put on. Um, but yeah, it's an it's an it's an odd one, really, because you you think a big uh, uh, if the nightingale ends up being largely unused um is that it does that mean they that they they, sh they shouldn't have built it and it, because it wasn't really needed or 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 have they done the right thing in in um in building it for a worst case scenario i, I think probably probably the latter but I, I suppose it's a bit it's a bit too early to judge it mm. yes because i think um question that some people have been asking as you've just mentioned is whether it should have whether there should have been more step down beds um which i understand is because is the model in kind of manchester and birmingham um yeah that's right and uh, I, fr from the sounds of it that that was what the kind of critical care community in london always wanted um that the, they wanted to keep as many patients in the existing departments as possible and to use the Nightingale as a as a kind of excess um, facility to to where they could discharge patients to, um, and if you actually if you actually look at the um, the admission criteria for the Nightingale, it's it's quite strict in the in the type of patients that it can admit. Um, that, so, so, in in a way, you could say it was designed not to take to not to take that many pa not to take that many ICU patients, and it might well end up being much more of a step down uh, facility like the one in Manchester, uh, where where they've had a bit more time to see how the pandemic develops, um, and and to kind of learn from London, I suppose. Th there's also another um, another factor in that. Uh, the the kind of early evidence from China apparently suggested that most patients um, who who uh, needed sort of uh, oxygen were, were going to have to be uh, intubated with in, invasive ventilation. Um, but a, as this develops, it, apparently a lot more um, that 
a lot more doctors are finding they can treat patients with um, non-invasive ventilation mm -hmm. with uh, sort of face masks, which means they don't need full ICU care. Um, so, so Manchester have learned from this uh, with the benefit of having more time um, and, and, and their facility at, at, the, at, the, conf at the Manchester Central Conference Centre is, is just a step down one um, like the one in Birmingham apparently too. Mm. Mm, it's interesting that you mentioned having a little bit more time to think about it because obviously London was um, the, the surge hit London um, faster than anywhere else in the country so I suppose that kind of um, the Excel was put together quite quite quickly maybe they had more time they'd have done it differently but um, another I another remember point... Annabelle that um, we were only looking at Italy like what, three four weeks ago thinking what would happen if that hits us I remember you know that that was the the horror the horror stories that we thought well, you know mm. we that wouldn't necessarily be what happens to us. You can see when what's happened in Lombardy at the kind of the centre of the outbreak when they were having to apply rules such as over 60s weren't getting ICU beds. Um, I suppose there was that big push to ensure that wouldn't be something that would be happening here. So you can see the thinking behind it, but obviously it's such a, a swift developing um, issue. You start then thinking with what capacity there is in ICU versus where else they could have put some of that resources to just shore up some other areas. Yes, no, abs absolutely, Sharon. I think um, obviously um, a lot of the debate has now turned to what's going on in the community. Um, and we published uh, another story from you over the weekend. Um, do you think, could you could you kind of take us over a few of the, the main points that came out of that? Absolutely. I think one of the things that came up quite clearly is that there was obviously, and rightly so, a focus on acute and making sure that people who needed ventilators were receiving those. But the um, chief executive of the Queen's Nursing Institute said to me um, when they announced uh, three weeks ago, I think Simon Stevens announced about 52 hospitals worth of patients had been discharged. And she said to me, am I the only one to think about where they've gone to? And I think there is a concern that while there's been a focus on the acute, the, the, the capacity within the community has to some extent been overlooked and there's a bit of a catch up happening now. Um, so to be clear, that means when people are being discharged, they're expected a much higher number to be discharged and there'll be a much greater acuity, which means they'll be more ill. And that's partly because the discharge criteria um, changed a few weeks ago to ensure that bed numbers in hospitals could be kept um, uh, so that bed occupancy could, could be kept low. Um, so there's expected to be a lot more nursing needs within um, the community. So things like more people needing home intravenous antibiotics, or oxygen or um, blood tests, that kind of thing. And obviously the nursing capacity is already stretched. I think it was around four, uh, we had around 7,000 district nurses in 2010, and that's now dropped to about 4,000. So those nurses are beginning to look about how they can prioritize patients. Um, so which patients can wait longer for treatment, if, which, which care can be given to other people to provide, um, and those they have to focus on. Um, and while that they think that might help um, maintaining um, capacity to take on these patients, there is still a bit of an unknown, um, a bit of an unknown about how many are really going to be expected to be discharged to the community and at what acuity level they'll be discharged. Um, and also you, you would have seen that the care homes thing has finally hit, mm. you know, hit crisis point. Um, we did, uh, HSJ did actually cover, 26 days ago, we covered the issue about um, care homes asking to test patients that were coming into their care homes and they didn't have the ability to do that. And now Matt Hancock said today that you know, that will be enabled. So anyone coming up hospital, will, they will know if they're COVID positive before they go in. Um, but a lot of that worry about care homes is obviously, again, tipping into capacity because they've now got care home staff who, let's remember, are often on minimum wage, um, are sick now because they might have COVID themselves or they have um, coronavirus running through care homes, meaning that some beds are no longer available. Um, so what we're beginning to hear is there's beginning to be a concern about the community capacity, but also that some, CG, some CCGs now appear to be block booking hotels. Um, so we know in Liverpool, they uh, booked 500 beds that they intend to use as kind of a step down from hospital if care homes become um, filled, either because of the, the, the beds all taken or because the staffing numbers just aren't there. And I think there's other CCGs in, in the North East that are also looking at doing this. Um, so I think we're only just beginning to see now some of the kind of knock on effects of that focus on acute and how that is impacting on kind of the capacity that's in community. And I would expect in the next week or so to start hearing more and more about which people are being looked after in the community and where those gaps are, are, are arising. And Sharon, would you agree that 
um, the kind of the state of community care, um, particularly kind of health visiting and district nursing. It was quite precarious before we went into this. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was, yeah, yeah. Um, I know, Anna, but you're a star, you're a um, staffing expert, so you, you know you know a lot, a lot of the. You could probably see a lot of this coming. Um, it was really precarious. District nurses think the main problem that people don't realise is um, with an acute ward. If you're full, you're full, and you can just say we can't take in more people. Mm -hmm. The community, the patients are basically in their own home. So someone described it as a as a ward with expanding walls. You're never full and you can never turn patients down because you can't relocate them somewhere else because they're in their own homes mm -hmm. um, so there is talk now about what plan b would be there is discussion whether social work um, social like care workers could come in and, and do some basic um medical treatments such as administering um insulin for example but that's quite a far-fetched idea to ask just domiciliary care workers themselves to start mm -hmm. looking at adding what they do and on top of that, this PPE issue, which is obviously now hit home really hard in the nursing and care sector, no one has yet really discussed it in, in the domiciliary care sector. But I'm hearing that, um, you know, care workers, again, on minimum wage, again, one of the, you know, the lowest paid members in, in, in society are struggling to get PPE and um, are going in and out of maybe 30 people's homes a day. So they, they could well end up being what we call super spreaders. Um, through no fault of their own. So I really do think this issue around capacity in, com in community hasn't yet, um, hasn't been very well thought out um, on, on many levels, really. I think like kind of the point about the difference with, with, with acute trust is really interesting because I think we would have had, if community trusts ever declared black alerts, we would have had them by now, kind of the, the sort of the emergency escalation like pro protocols are much more clear usually in hospitals whereas I think yeah we would have already had that in parts of the community trust uh, sector as well as in you've also got um, to remember that yeah. in acute if someone's being left and maybe not receiving the treatment that they need they're, they're visibly present I mean they have a bleep and a call bell whether it's been answered or not but if people are in their own homes and waiting to receive care and, and aren't able to get that or someone's off sick or someone can't make that visit they are kind of effectively stuck behind closed doors with no one quite aware of what's going on so um i've been speaking with a lot of community providers they are they are coping they have done remarkable changes to where they deploy their staff they are managing but there is that concern still that's keeping people awake at night like what happens when community capacity surges in the same way that acute has and and you know what what will happen to those people and i still don't feel there's a very clear nationally thought out plan about that no absolutely and i think that links um quite well onto our kind of our next topic which is kind of the some of the figures and obviously um kind of um the debate around fig, um kind of um death fig, death figures in um the community and in care homes is not being reported in the same way as um that in, that in um hospitals um, and that's kind of getting a continued amount of attention. Um, and um, I was just hoping to bring in um, Lawrence here just to kind of touch on this issue. We've reported a story this week um, looking at how um, um, suggestions of government has kind of misled the public using the French figures. Um, what, what, what would be your take on that, Lawrence? Yeah, so so just in in summary, the, the 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 daily slides that the government have been using in their press conferences suggested that there have been more deaths in in France than than here, um, and 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 suggested they were a like like for like comparison of hospital deaths, um, but but it turns out the the French figures included deaths in the community, um, including care homes. And, and so that's why they were higher. Um, and the, the, there's been a wider debate as well uh, uh, around why, why deaths in care homes aren't included in the English figures, where we get this daily announcement from NHS England um, about the number of hospital deaths, which obviously excludes excludes those in, in the community um, and kind of gives them a heightened importance, I suppose. Um, and, and the problem is that the, there's just a massive data lag with with the with the community deaths. Um, so they're about two weeks behind. Um, and I suppose, you, you know, there, there are there are many, many more um, care home facilities than there are NHS hospitals. So it's so it's going to be very difficult to collect that data. But 
you you could argue that in in this sort of in this sort of time they should they should be doing all they can to to get that data much quicker um the 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 other really interesting thing this week was that the ONS um published uh the some some wider data on deaths for the first quarter of this year um and and it put it put the coronavirus deaths in context um in that it, it gave the de- the five year average um for the number of deaths for the last week of march was 10000 and this year there were 16000 deaths so that's 6000 more 3,500 of those were um, mentioned um, COVID-19 on the on the um, as the, as the re- as a, a reason for the death. Um, so so a bit over half. Um, the the that remaining two and a half thousand is a bit unclear. Um, perhaps perhaps COVID-19 was a factor, but it just wasn't noted down as one. Um, or or there could have been a myriad of other reasons. Um, the 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 downside to that data is it's it's just up until the end of March, so it doesn't take into account the last two weeks when the when the coronavirus deaths have really ramped up. It, uh, it just just to come in there, Lawrence. They, the the last two weeks since first uh, of April, that's um, on the on the official hospital data is eight thousand one hundred twenty seven of the. 11,600 so it's kind of it comprises a good you know n- nearly three quarters I think no more more like two thirds but um of, of that J- just just for reference uh from April yeah, yeah. but I, I don't know if, if that brings us to um kind of that data being uh, from hospitals and obviously there's still a debate being had about uh whether the data should include more from community settings. Uh, I mean, the social care population, just for reference, is about 400,000 people. So even if the mail uh, was right, uh, I think it was yesterday morning, just 2,000 deaths uh, in care homes is still a significant proportion and we, sh- and we should expect quite a lot more. But um, whilst just some conversations I've been having recently with kind of hospital management people and um, kind of senior management people, uh, while no one would say um, publicly, at all, like no, no one thinks the battle is is at all won in hospitals. Um, it is it is well noted uh, by people that that lots of these beds, lots of beds are remaining empty across the system. That kind of that for understandable reasons, the system has kind of pumped a lot of resource into increasing ICU capacity, um, often to the detriment of other things. Like uh, we've reported earlier this month. Uh, concerns from uh, the Royal College of um, Child uh, of Pediatrics about um, some some deaths that might have been avoidable um, because the capacity had been shifted, uh, so much had been shifted. Uh, the the point being, people are starting to to think about how we move away from the crisis phase of dealing with with COVID nineteen to dealing uh, dealing with it as part of a business as usual um, situation. So how trusts can start to make uh, how a system, the hospital system in particular, can start to claw back some of the ground it's lost, particularly on electives. Um, as we know, kind of like all elective procedures were, have been cancelled. Um, uh, and we don't know how long that's that's going to be in place for. But we do know that the, the picture was already very grim on the growing waiting list and the growing amount of time the people on the waiting list had waited uh, before uh, coronavirus hit at all. So there's a lot of work to do there, but there's been some thinking going on already about uh, what a system in which kind of COVID-19 was kind of endemic um, rather than at crisis levels might look like. Uh, and obviously, like one of the concerns that people raised with me was just about the uh, how you do the elective surgeries, particularly because anything involving anesthesia obviously involves uh, anaesthetists and their equipment, their gas, uh, which is going to be used a lot of the time in the COVID wards. And also, if you have people who are very poorly after after a big operation or before a big operation, how you um, how you guarantee they're not going to get COVID when they go in? So how do you guarantee kind of COVID-free hospitals for people who are in a lot of need like that? Um, it's going to be a big issue. Like the way it was described to me is we we might see a situation like in a year's time where you have like two or three 
designated like full-time COVID hospitals and people have bought there from all over the place whilst you try and keep the rest of the provision uh, clear and also that we might start seeing kind of uh, hospital acquired COVID infections as a uh, as a real issue um, on on people's uh, causes of death or on clinical negligence claims. Um, another thing people brought up was that, a, and this was from a trust um, which again didn't want to say uh, we feel like we're past the peak, but they they're saying we, we're maybe getting towards this. Is that we already we already don't have much evidence on the like the long term prognosis for people who are discharged uh, from hospital having having survived. Uh, coronavirus. Um, they said what their medics were seeing so far was often the outcomes were poor for people when they were when they'd gone back to their homes or gone back to the community, which kind of goes back to what Sharon was saying about um, it's not entirely clear uh, how many people are just dying at home yet, and the kind of increasingly the police are finding people in their homes who've, who've just died died alone but anyway uh the, those medics were saying kind of it's often stroke kind of blood clotting and respiratory issues um that uh for, have uh, done for people when they've gone back out into the community and that this is something that's gonna kind of affect the provision of services over the next little while I think a lot of that what you're talking about Ben is just the sheer um, nature of, of coronavirus and the fact it's um um it's just unknown, like it's unknown uh, how best to treat people and that's evolving every day, which I think going back to the start of the conversation is partly why London has a different setup in its Nightingale Hospital to how Manchester does. And it's also unknown how it affect people on the long term, uh, in the long term and, and, and the kind of impact it has on people. And to add to that list of unknowns, to, to go back initially to what Lawrence was saying about the increased number of deaths that we've seen this week that aren't directly attributable to coronavirus, we don't really know what's going on to um, uh, to those people who need hospital treatment um, but don't have coronavirus. So um, not only are we seeing empty wards, um, we're seeing A&E's um, attendances, you know, drop phenomenally to the point where it can't just be the um, the kind of the worried well turned up an A&E inappropriately. And I've, you know, one of the things HSJ is going to be looking at going forward is um, what is happening to people who've got long-term conditions such as cancer um, or heart issues or people who are, who are having strokes and you know how is their treatment going um, and we just don't know at the moment because a lot of this information is not being counted. Um, we have heard concerns at the two-week wait uh, which is where um, people who are um, at who, who GPs believe are at, ris are at risk of having cancer were referred to consultants for a diagnosis. We have, ha have heard concerns that that two-week wait list is, is going to be huge after the, um, uh, or significant after th this kind of crisis has abated. And what that hides, we don't know. We, we don't know how many people have had cancer and not been diagnosed or what, the, or what impact that has on their survival terms. Um, we obviously wrote a story about transplants and they've been stopped pretty much. Um, I've heard, I've heard one person already that was waiting for a heart transplant for four and a half years um, and just been told he's suspended from the list. Um, obviously those stories, you know, they're really heartbreaking, but equally you do have to think whether that person will weather the storm of the coronavirus and, and how much longer they, they can be on that waiting list for um, and, and be alive. And then on top of that, we've got concerns around stroke and, and heart attacks. I think some of this goes to, Lawrence, what you were saying, but um, uh, we don't really know where the people are with strokes. Um, I have spoken to stroke experts and they're saying this is a global issue. People just aren't really turning up to A&E. Um, so um, we don't really know um, whether those people are at home and, and, and too scared to call an ambulance um, or, or what's really happened with those. So I think there's a lot of unknowns that will be coming out of this. And, and one of them is not only how do you get back to kind of making your hospitals operational, but how do you get back to understanding what's been going on in our wider community while the coronavirus has kind of taken overall capacity um, to deal with other health stuff. No, yeah, absolutely. And I've also been thinking about um, the, well, the staffing side of things. We've seen, I think, um, about um, 15,000 or so extra staff joining the service. And they're obviously only here temporarily on the temporary register. And um, it's clear, like, the impact of this is, is, isn't, is you know, it's a kind of immediate kind of surge of cases. But as you've described, um, you know, kind of um, trying to get back to business as usual and um, you know are some of these kind of um, temporary staff members going to be needed in the future in some capacity to try and kind of you know um, make a 
small dent in um, some of the some of the um, elective waiting lists and so on. Um, and yeah, and feeding into that, Annabelle, um, the emotional toll on staff um, dealing with coronavirus is enormous. Um, and there has been, you know, there was the article we wrote from the RCS president saying that, you know, there is those staff going to be exhausted after coronavirus abates and they're going to have to have some form of break or or some kind of respite before they can then go on to tackle kind of the work that is business as usual that's been waiting. So to ask those staff to kind of ramp back up again to deal, th deal with them the, the elected backlog would probably be too much of an ask. So perhaps some of the, the newly registered will, will, will be able to stay on to kind of help um, ensure that staff do get that break that they need um, because I don't think anyone's really thought about the emotional toll yet or what that would look like um, no. both on staff and patients that have had coronavirus um, but it'd be very hard to imagine how you could get back to business as usual without some um, I don't, I don't know, some form of extra support required or you know it, it needs to kind of be thought through on a, on a, on a staff capacity level uh, not just on a staff number level I guess. I mean, just and the overall resource in the system, like the system was being run very hot and was gradually losing, well, in some cases, quite rapidly losing ground on all of the main quality and access metrics anyway. So it's a kind of, so the period of, of even catching up with the damage that's been done while it focuses on coronavirus, e even that's going to be a fairly significant increase in resources, presumably some way ahead of, of what was announced of the world, which we, we had beforehand you know I mean the government had already signaled an increase in in resources but it's gonna to have to be quite significant no absolutely well thank you all so much for your time we've come to the end of the podcast this week um and just to remind us to listeners um the hsj health check podcast is available every week on hsj.co.uk and all your favorite uh, podcast channels please do sub subscribe and get in touch if there's anything you'd like us to cover thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time